After the commercial success that was Silent Assassin, Io got to work on Hitman 3, which was originally intended to be the final entry in the series, leaving it off as a trilogy. We seriously thought that the world would have grown tired by Hitman after the third game. In March of 2004, Eidos would buy Io Interactive for 32 million British pounds, nearly 59 million US dollars at the time. Eight months into the development of this Hitman 3, Io came to the conclusion that their ambitious finale would not make Eidos' appointed release window, so the team held a meeting with, at the time, Eidos. CEO Mike McGarvey. After some discussion on what the team should do, they came to the decision of making a Hitman 2.5. As mentioned in the previous episode, Io was unable to get their hands on developer kits during the development of Codename 47, so it ended up being a PC exclusive, with Silent Assassin's sales far surpassing Codename 47's, maintaining itself as the best-selling title in the series as of 2009. Research told them that less than 10% of Silent Assassin owners had played Codename 47. This Hitman 2.5 would remake levels from Codename 47, allowing the console players to experience them for the first time. This is why in the Codename 47 episode, I said that Blood Money was the third mainline title, because half of this game is a remake. But after some contemplation, I don't think it's entirely fair, especially knowing the events I do now, to just disregard the other half of the game, which is new levels. So IO split development between Hitman 2.5, which would eventually be known today as Hitman Contracts, while another part worked on the proper sequel, which would eventually become Hitman Blood Money, and another project, Mercenaries, which eventually down the line would become Kane and Lynch. This small scale and crew working on contracts would then get the game made from the ground up in just nine months. Making a game in and of itself is already an incredibly difficult task, but the fact that they made this game in such a small time frame, even with half of it being a remake, is genuinely astonishing, and I deeply respect and commend this team for the stressful work they must have had to go through, especially considering the comments of their working conditions made by Tor Blistad, art director of Blood Money and game director of Absolution, like their lack of air conditioning and how the building automatically opened its ceiling windows at 2am, leaving the overworked employee shivering at their computers. Contracts opens to a wounded 47 stumbling through what seems to be a hotel or apartment building before collapsing unconscious in a room. The rest of the cutscenes in this game play out as 47 is losing his tenuous grasp on reality, where scenes in this room merge into fever dream-esque flashbacks of previous missions. I love these cutscenes. Their creative transitions are so engaging and always has you wondering what is real and what is in 47's mind going haywire as he bleeds out on the floor. The score by Jesper Kidd accompanies these scenes perfectly. The opening when you first boot up the game could honestly be put into a Silent Hill game and it wouldn't seem that out of place. It might be reading too much into things, but I see the overworked devs in these cutscenes. I imagine this is what it was like when they were working their 48-hour shifts and 100-hour work weeks. We're finally out of the woods with trying to get these games to run on modern hardware, so no more mini-tutorials in the middle of these videos. As for new additions to gameplay, there really isn't that much. Syringes have now replaced anesthetics, which I think is a welcome change because the syringe is far less awkward to use, especially thanks to the fact that walking speeds and sneak mode have been greatly increased. The now iconic circular inventory was introduced in this game, which is one of my favorite item menus in games, but it wouldn't be until Blood Money where we get the wonderful whooshing sound as you cycle through the items. The HUD has been redesigned again, and while it looks good, I do wish it was at the top of the screen, and if you're playing this on an average size modern monitor, it's not going to scale that well, leaving the prompts for actions kind of small. Disguises work pretty much identical to how they were in Silent Assassin, with only bumping into guards or running really close to them and acting suspicious will blow your cover. For the most part, The AI is better than Silent Assassin, at least from my experiences, but it still has the ever-charming jank that you come to love as a fan of this franchise. Like I said a few minutes ago, half of this game is remade levels of Codename 47, so let's compare and contrast these levels in this game and their Codename 47 incarnation. 
Mission 1 plays out the final minutes of Codename 47. We get to see 47 kill Ortmeier, and the actual level itself is the aftermath. Right away you can see that the cloning lab has been redesigned and looks awesome. It is also now filled somehow with all the mental patients from upstairs. If you time it right you could even see one of the patients carrying the minigun used in Codename 47. The other biggest change is now the SWAT team storming the building has been moved to as you were trying to leave, where it was originally before you were getting into the underground lab to start the final level. Other than that, the building upstairs looks generally the same in layout, but is far grosser with the texture work to portray just how horrible this place is, like it was most likely originally envisioned. This is the type of stuff I love from remakes, where it allows them to enhance the atmosphere, which was once held back by hardware limitations. Since this level is supposed to be after the events of Codename 47, we don't get to fight the clones, which I think would have been a really cool mission given the new layout of the laboratory. Mission 6 is the next mission that is a remake, which actually fuses both of the Rotterdam levels together. I wish all of the remade levels were like this one, because while it keeps the base the same, it's different enough that you could consider it its own unique level. It brings back stuff like getting the dancer to distract the driver with a blowjob so you could place the tracker on his car, but unlike the original, they added multiple scenarios for how you could play this level out, so it's no longer a mandatory thing to do. With new additions to this level, they ended up cutting a lot of the fat from the originals, and in my opinion makes this a far more enjoyable single level than the bloated two from the first game. With the redesigned level layout, it removes pretty much all of the tedious walking from objective to objective, which was by far my biggest qualm with the original game. The randomness of where the car goes, needing you to track it down to intercept the gun deal so you can move the tracker from the car to the case of money, which would then lead you to Boris for the second level has all been removed. Disarming the nuke is also no longer a mandatory aspect of this level, making the tracker, again, not as important, allowing for wider variation to take place. Even if Boris arms the nuke in this version, you can kill him and complete the mission without it going off. You also don't need to drive the ship out into international waters like the original. As for other new additions, the police actually play a huge role in this version, as they raid Boris's ship, killing all of his henchmen, and you could even join them with stealing a disguise by knocking out a SWAT member before their assault begins, allowing you to use their helicopter to escape, but it's potentially bugged depending on the version as noted on the wiki, and I ended up running into this bug in my play through for this video. Mission 7 is pretty much a one-to-one -one recreation of my favorite level in Codename 47, the hotel. It added on a small wing where there is a murder and you can see ghosts, which is one of my favorite little details in this game. And the only other notable change is that they changed the level from day to night, which will be a theme with the rest of these remade levels to fit the more muted tone of this game. I struggle to find any differences other than you can now kill Franz in the pool instead of only the sauna. The remaining levels are remakes from the first four levels of Codename 47, the Hong Kong Gang War assassinations, and here is where the game kinda starts to fall flat. See, the first half of the game was all new missions, then halfway through the game it's just remakes with only slight variations due to level layout and maybe one new addition. The issue with this is that these Hong Kong levels are the first levels of Codename 47 and work as your introduction to that game's mechanics and world. Now having them halfway through the game it feels like a dip in complexity compared to the original levels, which by comparison had way more going on within them. Mission 8 of this game is the first level of Codename 47 and takes all of two minutes to complete. Lee Hong's assassination actually takes more away than it adds. No longer is there the old shopkeeper who gives you the poison after retrieving the jade statue. Instead, you get laxatives from the bar and you put it in the soup that Lee Hong's guard drinks, instead of getting this wonderful scene from the original. Since the poison is gone, the jade statue has been reworked into just something that you need to complete the mission. The game also pretty much abandons the cool fever dream reality transitions and just throws you right into missions like, uh, we don't really know how to transition into this level organically, so bam, you're here now. I think this issue could have been mitigated if these levels were the opening of this game, and the actual new levels were the second half after 47 recovers, but maybe repeating the start of the first game would have been more of a focus. 
faux pas. At the very least, I wish they were more like the Rotterdam mission, blending them together with new elements or bring back even small segments of Columbia, because those were the levels that I think needed the rework the most. As for the original levels, they're great. Anyone who is a hardcore fan of this game usually has the Meat King mission as their favorite level, and for good reason. It's one of the coolest settings in the series. This scuzzy meatpacking plant is housing the Sturrock brothers who kidnapped and killed your client's daughter. The cold, oppressive blues and harsh oranges used to color this level along with Jesper Kidd's score create this wonderfully unsettling atmosphere. The only original level I have any issue with is sadly the final level, because it doesn't feel like a final mission. You evade the SWAT team storming the building, and kill the detective who shot you before the game starts, and you get away. You run into Diana on the plane, and you get briefed on your next mission, which is a sequel stinger for the next game. It honestly feels like the penultimate mission leading to your final hit that never comes. The second half of this game is what's holding it back, and its rush development of 7-9 to nine months really shows in its closing act, receiving only slightly better scores than Codename 47, sitting at an average of 74% for PC, 78% for the original Xbox, and 80% for the PS2 on Metacritic. Anderson's claim about people getting sick of Hitman would be partially proven right, with critics saying while Contracts was a competent stealth game, it didn't bring much innovation and was more of the same. Some sites praised the remade Codename 47 levels, saying it fixed a lot of the issues from the first game, while others found it a lazy rehash. The game would go on to sell 2 million units by 2009, and was the 8th highest grossing console game of April 2004, making $4 million. But due to licensing issues with the song Immortals by Clutch that played during the Rotterdam mission, the game didn't make its way onto digital storefront Steam until 2014. Even with the $4 million made during its launch month, Eidos reported profit warnings on May 26 due to expecting $16 million in Hitman reorders. On a more positive note, Jesper Kidd's soundtrack for the game would go on to win a BAFTA in 2005 for Best Original Music. With the completion of contracts, this skeleton crew would rejoin the main team and continue to work towards their magnum opus, Hitman Blood Money. If you've made it this far into the video, I just want to say thanks for watching as always. If you really like the channel and these videos, maybe consider supporting me on Patreon. And if you're not already, to subscribe and hit the bell so you don't ever miss any uploads because YouTube doesn't like it when you don't upload through long periods of time, even if it is because you're working on big videos. So then they end up not getting recommended. Follow me on Twitter for your video updates to see what I'm currently working on. And if you're a card game player of any kind, I have a TCG player affiliate link. If you're planning on buying any cards, just use the the link in the description below and it'll help support the channel. As for what my next video is, it's most likely going to be GX Season 2 just so I can get it out of the way and focus on some more larger projects that I've been chomping at the bits to get to. Again, as always, thanks for watching and see you next time.